Hi there, Michelle here from Shell McQuay TV. We're helping you find ways to move from functioning to flourishing by putting the latest research to the real world test. To help us today, I'm very pleased to introduce you to Michael Steger. Michael is an Associate Professor of Psychology at Colorado State University. He's spent more than a decade researching people's ability to find meaning in their lives and the benefits of living a meaningful life. He's published more than 100 peer-reviewed journal articles and scholarly book chapters and is the co-editor of Designing Positive Psychology and Purpose and Meaning in the Workplace. He currently serves as the Associate Editor of the Journal of Personality and serves on the editorial board of several other journals in his spare time. He's the developer of the Meaning in Life questionnaire, which has become the most widely used measure of meaning and purpose in the world. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, Michelle. It's great to be here. So, Michael, I was so looking forward to this conversation because I think we continue to see in research in organisations that people are not rating having meaning in their job, a sense of purpose in what they do, is often the number one thing they're wanting in their work, more than money, more than flexibility, even more than job security. They're wanting to feel that what they do matters. So why do you think meaning rates so highly for us when it comes to our jobs and what are the benefits it might bring for us? I think that's a really great question. It's it's easy to just take a look at the reports that are coming out and say, well, we should definitely get our hands on some of this meaningful work stuff or meaning in life. And really to unpack what's what's happening is a bit more challenging, though. In in some ways, I think meaningful work represents to people the best that work can be. And, you know, we we spend most of our lives now, it seems like, most of our waking lives are at least accessible to work. You know, in, in some of my talks, I show a picture of a, of a guy with a laptop on the beach. And, uh, you know, first I say, best job ever. And then the next slide, same picture, worst vacation ever. And there's really no difference anymore. You know, it's the, it's the, you know, the phone calls during Sunday dinner. It's the emails at 2 a.m. It's the, it's the conference calls with, with the person in the bathroom. Or maybe you are the person in the bathroom during the conference call. But it's all the time. So my, my own personal take on this is that, Work is asking more and more of our personal lives. We're more productive as a, as a species and as a society than we ever have been per person. We are compensated, most of us, less than we used to be for the same amount of, of work that we put in. And we just see that work is asking more and more of our personal lives. And it makes a lot of sense then to blur the boundaries between our personal lives and work and say, I want my life to be important. I want my life to matter. I can't take work out of that. Work is sort of what we, it's the conduit for, through which we make our impact on the world anymore. So I think that's really what it's expressing. You mentioned that a lot, of, a lot of times when people leave work, they'll leave because they don't feel a sense of security, they don't feel respected, they don't feel like there's avenues to move up in an organization. Uh, I'm a Gen Xer, so of course we're kind of sandwiched between two gigantic cohorts, and so a lot of folks are, are talking to me about feeling that way as well. When they talk about meaningful work, though, I think it, it, it's a little bit of a shorthand to pull all those threads together. If you have a meaningful job, you're less dependent on what happens within the, the controls of those outside of you, and you're more expressive of what truly matters to you. You are expressing the, the values that you have, you're using the strengths that you have, and you're working to make a positive impact on the planet around you. And I think those all the those those values seem to increase in importance as we as we recognize the world is so small and we only have so much time. Yeah. I think that's such an important part of it that we need to feel like what we're doing in the world matters in some way or makes a positive difference in some way. Um, I saw some research recently that suggested when it came to our meaning in our work, it was that sense that what we did had a positive impact somewhere. So I think, you know, meaning can feel like a big thing to get our arms around when it comes to our jobs, particularly if we're not in a not-for-profit or a service-orientated business where we feel it's very cause or purpose driven. Um, for a lot of us, you know, we work in jobs that feel a lot more functional. And I know for myself, when I was in a large accounting firm and starting to try and find a bit more meaning and purpose in my work, at times it was like looking for a needle in a haystack. <laughs> so can meaning really be found in any job? Or is it something that we need to be feeling like we're really making a big impact on the world in order to have it? Yeah, there's a, there's a great Dilbert cartoon. It shows one of the 
sort of nameless worker people sitting next to Dilbert, and he says, I want my life to have meaning. And Dilbert says, can't do that here. <laughs> you know, that there's, you know, there's a sense that some workplaces really don't see themselves as taking on the responsibility for how a person is doing. But people see that work is such a huge part of their lives. And, you know, really when we, when we break down from a research endeavor, what meaningful work is, it's, it's three, three really easy to understand building blocks, I think. The first is, um, and this is the oldest one, you can actually sense that this one maybe even goes back to the, to the late 1800s with Durkheim, the sociologist who studied suicide, and he found that not having a role or a function in society was one of many factors that seemed to increase people's sense that life isn't really for them. They don't have something going on. So at work, the, the analogy is every person needs to feel like what they're doing is it has a function or, or it's not pointless. You know, it has a real function that people care about in an organization. Somebody somewhere wrote a job description and said we're going to allocate resources to recruit someone to do this thing. We need to make sure that everyone who's doing that thing then feels like they're making uh, an impact. They're not just doing senseless, pointless work. So that's what the tasks are. Then at the next level, I think what people are looking for is work that is in harmony with the rest of their life. I do some, I do some work in, in Singapore, and, and one of the first things that was pointed out to me was that there's no such thing as work-life balance anymore. We don't even, we've given up completely on that idea. So it's work-life harmony. Yeah. It's like work, work-life harmony now because they, they're just, they both take up a lot of space and they just need to be blended together in a way that, that's nourishing in both domains. So there it's really, a, it's really a dialogue of how does what I do at work um, express my values, help me build meaning in the rest of my life. And then and you pointed out to maybe the most important one, and I feel like this was a little controversial for me because it felt like a particular kind or flavor of meaningful work, but from the data that I've worked with, I can't get rid of this notion. So this is deeply embedded in people um, all around the world. And this is that sense that we want to do something that makes a contribution to something bigger than us. And you know, when you talk with people, and this leads a little bit into the question of can any job be meaningful? Some people do have those sort of direct care jobs that you mentioned where um, you know every day they go and they see that they they work and their effort makes something something better. And we have certain ways that we think that we should recognize that. Healing the sick, taking care of the needy and the vulnerable, teaching people. Um, but there's a lot of other ways to, to think about what that positive impact can be. We want to make the world a better place. Some people feel like that's, there's a species that they care about a lot, or an ecosystem, or um, an organization they want to be there after they're gone. So there's lots of different ways people can do this. And as long as you see that your effort, you're, I mean, you're trading your time. You've got a finite source. You're trading it for something. You want to trade it for a way to make a positive impact on the world. That seems to really push a lot of the sense that work is meaningful for people. So any job where people do that should, should, be, should be nice. And I think that's such a great way to think about it in those three steps. And I know many organisations have sort of been grappling with for those where the sense of purpose and meaning might not be so obvious or people's roles feel a long way from the impact that the work is really having. How do you kind of bring that in and make it real for people? And a lot of the leaders I talk to at the moment in organisations, this is one of the first questions they ask me is, well, how do we make what we do meaningful? Because our people are kind of here in the central office so I'm working a lot with government at the moment so they're very centralized and they're not out doing it um, sort of you know face to face with uh, the community or the constituents that maybe first attracted them into those roles or in organizations and they feel perhaps in central roles like finance or HR or that a long way from the customers that the business is serving how do you create meaning in those um, for those people as a leader and I loved recently I've been looking at examples like the fact that Facebook 
talk. We'll bring in people who've been reunited on their site to talk to the coders in the back room, you know, every now and then to say, look, every line of code you write matters because this is the kind of impact that it could have. Or one of the banks bringing in, you know, customers who've gotten loans uh, for their businesses or the dreams that they've got that they want to put into the world and then bringing them in to talk to banking staff to say, well, you know, this is what your work enabled for me to do in the world and without what you do, this wouldn't happen. So what are you finding organisations or leaders can do to perhaps help make work more meaningful where it's not always as obvious for people? This is a really, really fantastic question because up until really very recently, I think meaningful work has been seen as something that's the responsibility of an individual person. And, you know, some visionary leaders think that they are going to build a, a company that will attract people who are just driven like that. And certainly there's many examples of, of that uh, type of phenomenon, you know, where the, the, the organization has built such a culture that they can be relatively selective in who they recruit and they have nice retention and the people who are there really have a sense of buy-in and camaraderie. That's, that's great if you're starting a company and particularly if your company has been successful all along. Um, I've seen it be a little bit easier in smaller companies as well where there's lots of contact between the, maybe even the owners, the CEO or the other executive level folks and you can, you can enable contact all throughout the organization. At, at a larger organization I think right now is maybe just the start of when folks, leaders and managers are trying to figure out how do I create this new meaningful work thing. You know, we're kind of moving on from commitments and we're really done with engagement and we just want to see something that ha is a, and I view that this is more of a two-way street, right? So uh, an organization that, that invests in meaningful work gets more performance, more commitment, um, reduced mental health and physical health costs because of their well-being benefits and so on. So how do they do that? Um, you know, I've, got, I've pushed everything into an acronym uh, that I, you know, I think is, is misspelled, but that's okay. So this is, this is my idea of karma. For, for leaders, but it's karma with a C, it's the best I can do. Uh, you know, it still is a sense that you reap what you sow, you get back what you put in. And the, really the overwhelming message behind that is if meaningful work is something you want the benefits of, then it has to start at the top, in a sense. Because if you can't express to people and articulate that, lay out a map, those examples you gave of, of banks, um, folks at Facebook, you know, I know that Adam Grant's other work is focused on fundraisers for you know, universities and other good causes and many other organizations. But if you can't express why what that person is doing for you makes a difference, why you value it, why it should make them feel pretty good about their lives, then you're just kind of hoping that something's going to fall into place. So the, the very first part of that is, is presenting a very clear vision, so having clarity around what your organization is about. And I think this goes back to a very old but resurgent notion of the mission statement. You know, you start with why at this point. Why is your organization running the way it is, trying to recruit the people it does to do the things that you think are important? And what makes you different than someone else, some other organization that does this very similar thing? So if you can't express that and make sure that everyone kind of knows that you have a mission, that makes it very difficult to um, you know, go ahead and say, and it's really meaningful here, trust us. Go look at the mission, I can't really tell you what that is, you know. Um, I like to give an example that also leads into the next one of authenticity, which is the next A. And, uh, you know, what we, what we look at in, when we, there's a, it's a bit of a controversial organization in some ways, at least in the United States, this, this group called Starbucks, you may have heard, yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, kind of all around the world. Some people, you know, don't like them because they're gigantic. Some people think that they're trying to do more than just serve coffee. You know, that their mission is creeping in some sense. They had a, a big, um, you know, com complication about trying to start dialogues around race issues in the United States, for instance. But we had a we had a couple big downturns in the in the stock markets in the U.S. sort of the summer and in, in the spring. And um, you know, there's a lot of press coverage when when Howard Schultz came out with his with his memo. Every CEO is rolling out a memo like, look, we're not going under, everything's fine, your your 401k is still being funded and so on. And they all pointed to growth in China or they pointed to, you know, same store increased sales. And and so did Starbucks, but for for half of the memo, he really went he circled back right to their mission, which is to improve lives one cup at a time, essentially, right? So 
he, he said, there's this whole section in his, in his memo about our customers, the people we serve and interact with every day, might be under more stress today. They might be a little frazzled. So just take a little time to reach out and make sure that you, you know, their day goes a little bit smoother after they've, they've encountered you. And that reminds people of the mission, but it also demonstrates the mission, right? So, so it's really a great way to do it. Um, you know, I think the authenticity links with a lot of the authentic leadership, ethical leadership models, where if you're, a, if you're a scumbag, you know, you can't expect people to feel great working for you unless they're also scumbags and they don't care, right? So that's, you know, phony meaning, disrespect, all these sorts of things are going to deplete uh, meaningful work pretty quickly. There's a few other ideas out there, you know, that you need to help people understand how their work is important within the organization. So again, that's going beyond just just the mission, um, but linking all the tasks within the organization to the mission. And you know, not every organization has to have a mission of helping the world. You know, there's that's a really important thing. But part of it is that we want people who are working for us to feel good about the time they're spending, or else you get them malingering and people are trying to pick up their own idea of what what's supposed to happen. So um, I would just start in that sense, small, like how can you help people understand what your organization is all about and then link all that stuff directly to what they're doing. And those are pretty easy, small steps, right? Um, there's also ideas about mentoring and creating respect and, you know, also providing some autonomy, which is easier to do in some areas than others. But, um, you know, I think all of the innovation models right now are pointing to how, you know, solutions, problem solving, they don't come from uh, the top down only, that it's the people who are doing trial and error learning all along that are going to sort of percolate out solutions. So this, this is the same sort of thing. If you respect them enough to come up with solutions, you should respect them enough to make mistakes too. So Absolutely. And so uh, as leaders, if we're sort of playing with those pieces, and I think that having that clear why is so important. I love um, Simon Sinek in his work of Start With Why has a great challenge for leaders around, can you answer the sentence, everything I do is to dot dot, so that dot dot. <laughs> um, and I think that's a great way sometimes to think about a mission in the simplest form uh, so that it can be easily passed from one way to the other, one person to the next. And I think that authenticity then uh, to walk it, um, to help people see how the little things they do each day are connected to it, to feel those relationships of support um, around them as they do it, um, can definitely, and I've seen it firsthand, create relation, uh, create environments where there's more meaning in the work. But if you're in a role where perhaps the leaders aren't as enlightened to be able to do those things, and you're kind of like where I was in an accounting firm, struggling to find some meaning each day to keep bringing you into the office, what are the things that we could try personally that might also help us make work more meaningful do you think in the research yeah and, there, and there's hopes for for folks who stay in the accounting firms and don't go on to become international consulting stars so i did some research uh collecting stories you know just of meaningful work trying to wrap my own head around it and one of the people that responded is an accountant for you know local college it's we have all these different you know education levels this is a community college so it's supposed to it prioritizes accessibility, you know, so, um, you know, this person, I don't know, male or female, I, I could look it up, I don't remember, but, you know, this person was saying how um, when they do their job, they are creating opportunities for people to learn new skills, improve their lives, and improve their communities. So just being able to figure out how to run a, an institution in a responsible way financially, that's one thing, but this person went ahead and connected that to something bigger that was important to him or her again, right? So just an accountant, and I've heard that accountants and engineers can be tough crowds when, the, when it comes to, to meaningful work, but that's, that doesn't have to be the case. You know, I think about you know, someone who is designing a bridge, for instance. How, what an important impact on life around us that is. You know, we think about, when you think about when you travel, and you go to places where people have lived, don't you always want to spend time considering what they've built, right? So there's, there's all these really powerful avenues to finding meaning. I tried to bring them together in another uh, acronym, this one called SPIRE, and it focuses on some of the, the greatest hits in some ways of um, research on how to make work better for people. So the S stands for strengths. Um, know your strengths, but even more importantly, use, your, use some of your strengths every day. And, 
I know the research isn't quite settled on whether people should be working to develop lagging strengths or whether they should be really used the way they work best and most naturally. Um, I, I think in the business world it makes a little bit of sense at least to use <laughs> your strongest strengths because after all, uh, you know, I like to tell a story about this, this famous basketball player Michael Jordan in the U.S. who was maybe the greatest basketball player ever, but he quit for a while to play baseball. And he was a very mediocre baseball player, right? So, um, you know, people wanted him to show up to play basketball and, and thought it was a novelty for him to play baseball. So we really want to work from our strengths. The, the P in Inspire stands for personalization. So this is really trying to bring a little bit of ourselves in terms of, um, you know, who we are, what our perspective is, taking a little bit of responsibility for how we operate. There's the integration is the I, and that's really what we talked about earlier already about how can you make avenues where what you're doing at work feeds into what's meaningful for you in life. So it's really important for you to have sequester as much time as possible with your family. There's a little bit of a sense where that's not going to fit perfectly with, with having a highly competitive, um, ambitious work life. At the same time, maybe you, you work really hard to develop efficiency mechanisms that allow you to get more done in a short amount of time, negotiate work relationships with your employer, to be closer to home, whatever it is, right? So that little bit, just taking the time and recognizing that, okay, I made all these arrangements and it wasn't just to not have to go to the office, it was to be able to spend time with family, which is really important to me. So again, it's part of, about making everything harmonious in that sense. There's an R for uh, resonance, and that's diving deep into the company's mission. So hopefully the, your company at least has a decent mission that you can, that you can feel uh, that you can get behind. I mean, if you're working for a company who um, thinks the mission is just something they put on a plaque next to the dirty microwave that no one cleans, it's going to be a little bit hard. You might want to just kind of skip over that. But if you find some way in which you can care about and get behind what the company is trying to do, then, then that should help bolster meaning as well. And then finally the E is expansion. So expand your sense of whose stakes you're working for. And that's exactly you know what you've sort of talked about. And so this can be as big or as small as you want it to be. I mean it could be something where you um, open yourself up to being mentored even though you feel like you're doing pretty good because it makes one of your coworkers uh, feel like their experience is deeper at work. And so in a sense you're you're working in ways to give a little bit as you work. And for some people like that accountant I mentioned it's helping build communities one student at a time who gains skills they could never acquire otherwise. For the coders at Facebook and all the other people you mentioned, there's, there's bound to be a way if you're doing decent work where you can, with a little creativity, find some ways in which you're working for an expanded sense of what's important. And that was exactly, you know, those steps you've talked through and what I had to do at the accounting firm without knowing that that was the right thing to be doing. It was more from desperation than I have to say informed <laughs> intention. But I was like, okay, you know, I was in a marketing role for them and as much as I could see, the only mission I had was to make the partners more money and surprisingly that wasn't getting me out of bed every day after a while. And so I realised though I had a little team that reported to me and perhaps if I could make their work more enjoyable and could take more of a mentoring and coaching role to bring out the best in them, um, yeah. that would might maybe give me more meaning. And so it was really funny. I started, I guess, to focus a little more on the how. And I think a lot of those spire steps you've just explained tend to go to a bit more of the how we're working rather than so much the technical what we're doing. So I couldn't change my job description or what was required, but I could make some choices in how I went about it. So what were the strengths that I was using? How was I aligning my time a bit more to my personal values, how could I kind of exp um, expand a bit more on the mission of the organisation, which was, you know, to help businesses, you know, build a financial and stable community, I could get behind that, um, <laughs> and um, how could I integrate it a bit more into the other life that I was living in, that made a massive difference, the funniest thing was, and of course, as I said, I made the switch mostly for my own sanity, was that the more I went to that, the more meaningful the work became, the better I actually got at the technical bits. <laughs> 
<laughs> and the better the results that we were delivering. And it was a great lesson for me to go, you know what, just because a job looks like it doesn't have meaning in an easy and obvious way, one, doesn't mean that it can't be found. And two, what happens when we do have meaningful work, not just for our own sense of sort of happiness and satisfaction, uh, engagement in our work and our lives, but also for our performance overall. So it was a great one to play with. Um, the other one though, Michael, I really wanted to ask you about was that one of the challenges I get presented by some of my clients who are perhaps in more um, meaning driven organisations, so um, organisations perhaps working with the environment, um, hospitals, working with people's health or schools, working with teachers, is that sometimes the leaders will tell me they've got the opposite problem of having too much meaning in their staff. So, um, you know, we kind of go from one extreme to the other of not enough to too much. And some of the things they describe is the fear that when people have too much meaning, they're almost holding on too tightly um, to what they need to do in their jobs, um, becoming slightly obsessive about it, at risk of burning themselves out, maybe losing some of the flexibility to be able to work with other colleagues or adapt to change as the organisation has to change. So I yeah. wondered if you're seeing in your research, is this something that's common and how do organisations perhaps manage it when people have too much meaning in their work? It's fascinating. You know, there's a little bit of a, there's a growing interest in what the dark side of having a sense of calling or having a sense of meaningful work might be. There's the, the best, most entertaining paper I can think of is by Bunderson and Thompson. It's called Call of the Wild, um, a geoclassical exploration of calling among zookeepers, right? And, uh, you know, this, it's really informative. So I'll, bear with me just a little bit. So what they did was they, they, they explored what calling was like among zookeepers. And it's not a job I think all of us think of right away at all, right? I mean, it would sort of be taken for granted. But the people who are working there seem to quite frequently, particularly those who sense it as a calling, see their role as preserving biodiversity and preserving magnificent species on the planet. And that's more important than, you know, a lot of things. In fact, for a lot of folks in the, in the zookeeping profession, it ends up being more important than money. So they, they're, folks who are driven too much, in a sense, or maybe just it's just the, even the right amount are a little bit vulnerable to exploitation, right? And if we if we take a look at where you know the the, the industries where you talked about maybe there's almost too much meaning going on, those are also sort of just industries that have a similar dynamic. People will do it, and it's not about the money. So environmental organizations, healthcare organizations. The organizations will be there in a sense, right? You, you can see that in in disasters in countries where the infrastructure isn't sufficient to sustain healthcare. That from all around the world, healthcare workers will go there, relief workers, human care workers, and organizations exist just to do that kind of work where it's not being financially supported within a particular area. So almost as in a sense, just like people who are really passionate about an about an idea. They will go really deep into it, potentially become exploited and do more than, than is really being compensated for elementary school teachers, what have you. These almost the professions are, are, are similar. So there's there's a we kind of know this as a capital market capitalist society that people will do things we don't have to pay them. <laughs> if you know, it's kind of bad. I mean it's it's really bad, right? But um, it, it sets up a dynamic where whole industries exist based on the presumption that we, you just kind of sacrifice because the work is its own reward in a sense. I can see why people running these organizations wouldn't want to take that away because you can't always um, backfill with the sort of success markers of status, financial comfort and security. So I think understanding at least the dynamic of why are people coming to those organizations those organizations and those industries is important because it really is going to be passionate to them. So, um, you know, we've got, I think, two stages of issues that we might be confronting. The first is how can you help people who are who you're recruiting and selecting understand that at the end of the day, it's important to everybody. But the main thing is to keep the organization going because the organization needs to be keep doing work long after everyone is gone or moved on. So there's some part of the mission 
that has to care also about the organization that's sustaining it. And I think, I don't want to put myself too much in the heads of, of other folks, but I think that for a lot of people who are drawn to certain professions, it's, it's the beneficiary of the organization that is the driving cause, even more so than the organization itself. So somehow melding that together in, in a way that acknowledges that this isn't maybe the best paying profession or you can take these same skills elsewhere and you know have have a more competitive salary but we all need to sustain our what we're doing together so it's a little bit like raising kids in a sense right because we want all we want all their inner beauty and and inner passions to to come out until they start like trampling on what needs to be done and the and the inner passions and beauty of other people right so um, I think there's a way to respect that and also say um, both model and sort of maybe even teach how to, you know, take the longer view, even more so than what my career is going to accomplish. Does my career help support an organization that's going to be accomplishing things like that when, I'm, when I've moved on? So that's, that's kind of the first level. The second level is what do you do with someone who's already uh, you know, maybe inflexible, maybe doing things outside of the guidelines and things like that. Um, I would be reluctant to say that there would be a systematic, a system-wide solution to that. Um, I think it's going to go back to, you know, like you mentioned in your work, at the team level. Right? So these informal teams that, you know, you can try to create all the teams you want, but there's going to be some sort of team that's going to exist and build up. And what, what are the dynamics there? And if someone's feeling shunted aside from the team, is there some other way, because I think people tend to be a little bit more maverick when they feel not a part of something than when they feel that there is a cohesion that they can rely on. So I'd go look at the team and then just sort of see if there's a way to help integrate that person's desires uh, within some kind of bounds, you know. And really the reason I point to team is that it's that that empathetic bond with other people can be such such a more proximal impact on what we do than the guidelines say this, the <laughs> regulations say that. <laughs> it's a little better to uh, nudge the behaviours where you might want them to be. Do you think yeah. some of this, when we have too much meaning, do you think it maybe drifts us towards some of the research I know Professor Robert Valorand has looked at on obsessive passion? Like when I, when people in these organisations are kind of described to me, it almost sounds like that obsessive rather than harmonious passion, that this sense of purpose and meaning in their work is kind of consumed almost too much much of their life to the point where it's taking away uh, flexibility, it's taking away a bit of resilience and robustness for them. Does that align to, to what you're seeing or do you think perhaps it's something else that's going on for them? Yeah, no, I was, I was, you, you stole my thunder. I was oh, sorry. To, <laughs> I was going to try and lead into Robert's work. You know, we, we bump into each other once in a while and you know, we both uh, we both play, enjoy playing basketball. So we have all these conversations about you know all the injuries we've given ourselves over the years. It's like if you ever talk to your physician, it's like that's the worst activity you can do for your body. Apparently, they don't know anything. But you know, like this 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 sense of it, when a passion is working, it 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 is just inherently meaningful because it's 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 intrinsic, it's deep, it's rewarding. And it, it's done for all the right reasons, right? So it, that obsessive passion that you talk about, this is when people feel like they have to, they just have to do something. They don't enjoy it anymore. They, they feel uh, driven to spend time on it, expend resources on it. There's something inherently meaningless about that, in a sense, because when people trace the reasons for why they do things, you, you, you can't, I can't compel you to do something meaningful. I can't compel you to experience meaning. I can kind of trick you with like the right sappy YouTube videos, but I can't really make meaning, I can't push it into you, and you can't push it into me. So when the, when the, the motivation and the reasons and the rationale and the, and the fit with the rest of our lives isn't there, to some degree it, it doesn't seem like it's meaningful work anymore. And there's a, there's a lot of research, uh, Jennifer Crocker's research on contingencies of self-worth that sometimes we don't talk that much about in, in positive psychology. But this, this sense that we are, we're all complex people and in the ideal sense we have lots of different little buckets 
uh, into which we pour our self-worth. And if we just have one bucket and someone looks like they're going to kick it, <laughs> you know, we become a little intense about you know, our response to that. So in a sense, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a big element of psychological flexibility and maturity that goes on with that. Not to say that someone who feels driven is, is immature, but it's, um, it, it's maybe better to also build some additional buckets into which some of that passion can flow and release some of the you know, eh, neurosis about it. I think that's so important. Michael, thank you so much for your time today. It's been great chatting with you. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. It's been wonderful. And thank you for joining us. If you're looking for more on Michael's work, you're wanting his questionnaires on meaning in life or meaning at work, then head on over to michaelfsteger.com or visit meaningatwork.org. And of course, if you're looking for other tested practical ways you can move from functioning to flourishing at work, be sure to stop by michellemcquaid.com, leave your name and email address so you can hear all our news first. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching. Remember, you are good enough, so don't be afraid to let your strength shine. Until next time, take care.